Welcome to this, the first in our brand new series of car maintenance do-it-yourself videos. During our series, we'll be showing you how you can save hundreds of pounds a year by carrying out simple, uncomplicated servicing and repairs and have the satisfaction of knowing you've done it yourself. We shall not, however, be showing you how to cut corners by using inferior quality products or by using cheap and nasty tools. At best, that's a waste of time because they probably won't last as long and at worst, they could be positively dangerous. In this video, we shall be doing a service that can be carried out on most cars, whether it be overhead cam, as in this case, overhead valve, transverse or conventional north-south engines. We will also be showing you routine checks that should be done on a weekly basis and most definitely before any long journeys. Now the first thing we're going to do is drain the oil. And to do this, you may find it useful to put the car up on car ramps. But just a word to the wise. If you're going to put the car on car ramps or use axle stands or the car's jack, never do it alone. Always have someone on hand just in case. I'm going to ask my colleague, Mike Lynch, to give me a hand. You'll see that as we're working on a slippery surface, I've put the car mats down underneath the ramps to stop them from slipping. Okay, Mike, I'll see you up. Remember, when you buy your ramps or axle stands, look for a name that you recognize and ensure that the maximum load is clearly marked on the items that you buy. And don't forget, put a chock under the back wheels to ensure that the vehicle doesn't roll backwards and make sure that the handbrake is securely on. We've come inside to show you the kind of things that you'll need to carry out the service on your car and some of the things that you'll probably need to keep in your garage for topping up purposes throughout the year. One of the things that we're probably going to use today is an engine flush. This you will put inside your car's engine before you actually drain the oil. You can actually do up to about 100 miles with this actually in using your old oil as a carrying agent. And what this does, it breaks down the deposits of sludge and carbon and ensures that you have a nice clean engine to put your fresh oil into. Whilst dealing with the subject of oil, there are three basic styles or types of oil. There is a super multigrade, like this one, which is a 1540 grade. There is a 2050 grade, which is this one, which is mostly used in the engines with a higher mileage, such as 30,000 miles and more, and in engines which have the gearbox and engine as one unit such as the Mini, the Allegro, and that kind of vehicle. And then, of course, we now have diesel engines being used in private cars, and there is a specific oil designed especially for those to ensure that it stays as clean as possible for as long as possible. That's dealt with the oil. We now look at the filters that you'll, you'll use. Now, you may find a slight complication. On your car, you'll probably find that it's got an, an oil filter, something about the size of this one. But when you go to the shop, you may well be given one about the size of this one. This is quite straightforward, there is nothing wrong with it, and providing it's the one that's recommended for your car, it's simply that the manufacturers have now changed and call them a compact series. There are three basic types of oil filter removing tool. There's the soft or leather strap type, and there is the metal solid one. They all do basically the same job of tightening down on the filter and they vary in price from as little as £2.50 to five or six pounds. That's a good investment and it's a whole lot safer than as some people do drive a screwdriver through the filter. You run a very serious risk of doing damage to the threaded portion 
that will cost you probably four or five times as much as the cost of an oil filter tool to have to carry out the repair. And now we come to the draining of the oil itself. There are two basic types of drain plug with washers at, that, that need checking. This one uses a simple spanner to undo it. And this one, again, with a washer on it, uses a hexagonal type of removal tool. You'll have to check with your handbook to see which one is relevant to your car. And finally, you'll need something to catch the old oil in. We've used an empty container, an empty five litre container, cut the front out, check that your car only takes five litres, otherwise you could end up in a bit of a mess on the drive, and leave the top on. Then, when you've drained your oil and put your fresh oil in, you can tip your, your waste oil into the empty container, take it to your friendly local garage or refuse tip to dispose of it safely. You'll need plenty of old newspapers to save staining your drive, and lots of cloths to wipe your hands on. Right, this is what your car looks like from underneath. Mike's now going to remove the drain plug, and it looks as if this one needs a new seal from the way it's been leaking. Whilst we've got the car in this position and the oil's draining, Mike will check the gearbox and the back axle levels. But in fairness, you may find it easier to take it to your local garage. They'll probably only charge you a couple of pounds and it will be probably a whole lot safer. Right, we'll now replace the plug with a new seal on it. And having done that, and wiped off the sump so that no drips fall on the drive, we'll dr lower the car and change the filter. We're now going to remove the filter, but before we do, we're going to put some newspaper directly underneath it. That will catch any of the waste of the old oil that may drip from the oil filter when it's removed. Now we place the tool over the oil filter and twist it to the left. Spin it off and then tilt backwards and down to avoid the oil running. That's it. Right, and now we're ready for the new filter to go in. Before you actually put it on the vehicle, a smear of your new oil from the top of the can around the seal, that will just help it make a good joint. And then you spin the filter on. In fitting the filter, please do not use the same tool that you use to remove it, to replace it. Use only your hands and screw the filter up hand tight. That's more than sufficient. We're now ready to put the new oil into the engine. Remove the filler cap and on this particular car there's a, a filter inside. Make sure it's not blocked. Fairly clean. Okay, that's fine. Now let's pour the oil through a funnel into the engine. I would suggest that you use about three quarters of the, the can of oil, then run the engine for a while to ensure that the oil circulates and fills the new filter. When you've done that, check the oil level through your dipstick and top up to the required level. Now we come on to the next stage, having done the lubrication, and that's the plugs and the ignition. But before we go to that, just a reminder, you don't have to do all of these jobs on the same day or at the same time. Don't tire yourself out. Allocate so much time to each job and do it. A little and often is a far better maxim to use. The sparking plugs. There are two basic types of sparking plugs. A resistor type or a non-resistor type. If the manufacturers recommend that you have a resistor type in your car, 
Whilst they're more expensive, it's better that that's what you fit. You'll need a sparking plug tool, which could be either 10 millimetre or, as in this case, a 14 millimetre. A set of feeler gauges, and we would recommend that you get yourself a set which are a dual type. That's an imperial size which deals in thous, or a metric size which deals in metric and millimetre sizes. They will enable you to check the gap on the plugs and also to set the, the contact breakers or points as they're referred to. You'll also need a condenser. It could be this type which is mounted outside the distributor or it could be a shorter type which is fitted inside the distributor. Whatever you do, whenever you change the points, always fit a new condenser at the same time. That guarantees that the power to the points is consistent at all times. Then we come to the rotor arm, which on some cars, those for instance with electronic ignition, that's really all that you've got to worry about. If it's dirty or, or pitted around the edge, throw it away and fit a new one. Don't take a piece of sandpaper to it. And finally, the distributor cap where the plug leads and high tension leads go into. On the Ford, as indeed on many cars now, there is the Bosch type, which is brown, and that's the easiest way of recognising it, or there is the original Ford type, which is black. You'll be asked which one is fitted when you go to get your new parts. Of course you'll need a screwdriver, it may be an engineer's type, or it may be a Phillips head, but you'll need one of each anyway. And now let's go to the car and let's have a look at the old plugs. Remember to mark your plug leads so that you don't get them all mixed up when you have to replace them. We've marked them with these little gadgets that cost about a pound a set, but you could easily use masking tape and write on them one, two, three, four, etc. Now let's see what a condition these plugs are in. You may find them a little bit tight because plugs these days don't very often have the little washers on that they used to and they do tend to seize a little bit to the cylinder head. Now these plugs look in a pretty poor condition and we would recommend that these should be changed. We know this particular car and we can tell you the reason for this, these plugs being black is that the vehicle does very, very short journeys and therefore the choke is probably st still in operation nearly all the time it's, it's driving. That's the four plugs removed. We won't put in the new ones yet because we're going to go on to removing the distributor cap and putting in the new points and condenser. And leaving the plugs out will make the setting of the points gap easier later. Let's now check the plug leads for signs of cracking or burning. If you find any damaged ones, change them. And now we come to the distributor. We're now removing the cap. Whilst we've got the cap in our hand, let's check to see if it's in good condition. If you find any kind of cracking or arcing between the points inside the cap, then change it, as it will almost certainly give you serious trouble in the near future. We'll now check the rotor arm to see that it's in good condition. If it's pitted and worn, throw it away and fit a new one. And now we'll take the points out. You may find that in doing this job you have to be a little bit of a contortionist. But remember, these cars are designed by people that very seldom have to do their own repairs. If the points are pitted, worn or black, then replace them. The colour denotes that the condenser is not performing as it should and that it too should be replaced. So whenever you change the points, change the condenser. Always check that the earth wire is making a good connection to the base plate. This one is soldered. Yours may be screwed. Make sure that the connection is good. Now the condenser is fitted, 
we then come to the points. Put them in, but don't tighten them, as you'll have to slacken them off later to set the gap. Now we'll set the gap on the points. A small smear of grease on the nylon heel will allow them to turn more freely and prevent excess wear. To set the gap, make sure that one of the lobes of the cam is resting on the nylon heel of the points. We can do this by using the fan belt to turn the engine. That's why we left the plugs out to make it easy. You may have to put the car in fourth gear and rock it backwards and forwards, or put a spanner on the crankshaft pulley. To set the gap, you must make sure that the lobe on the edge is resting on the nylon heel of the points. That is the gap that you're looking for. Check with your handbook for the settings required. In this instance, it's 15 thou. Take your feeler gauges and place them between the two contacts. Make sure it's a nice, tight fit and then tighten the screw, making sure that you don't move the points. Having done that, double check the gap. Replace the rotor arm and the distributor cap, making sure that it's clipped firmly into position. Now check that the spark plug gaps are at the required setting. They are usually set when you buy them, but it's well worth double checking. and that's the ignition done. Right, having done the sparking plugs, we're now going to have a look at the air filter. This one is particularly filthy, so we're going to change it and put a new one in. And while Mike's fitting that, it probably is a good time to talk about carburation. In the main, our advice would be don't tamper with it if the vehicle is running well. But there are a couple of carburetors that should have a certain amount of tension at service, free, at service intervals. I refer to the SU carburetor, which has a damper on top and is fitted in the main to British Leyland cars, uh, such as Minis. They need a small amount of oil squirted in them if they're running dry. And the other type of carburetor is the Stromberg, which has a, a rubber diaphragm in it, which should be changed at roughly 12,000 miles intervals. When you pull out the piston, there's a needle valve which comes out with it. Be careful not to bend it. And if your car has got fuel injection, as some of the new cars have, if it's running well, leave well alone. If it's running badly, leave it to the experts. You've just been using one of these, the fan belt, to help you set the points. Whilst you're doing that process, Check to make sure that the belt isn't cracked or fraying or damaged in any way. Because if one of these breaks on you, it could cost you at very least a heavy towing fee and it also could cost you a new engine. Whilst we're on the subject of belts, let me show you this one. This is a flexible belt known as a cam belt and is fitted on all overhead cam engines. It has serrations on it and has to be changed at pre-set intervals set by the manufacturers of your car. Don't attempt to do it yourself, it's a very involved job and if one of these breaks on you on the motorway at high speed it really will cost you a new engine. Having dealt with the belts, that leads us nicely on to the cooling system. Now let's see what we need to check that. Right. The cooling system test check that you're doing is one that should be done roughly twice a year, once before the summer and once before the winter. 
and you're doing it with a little gadget like this which resembles an eyedropper with four colored beads inside and what these beads do when you take some water from your cooling system will tell you on the uh, guide at the side there what the specific gravity of the cooling system fluid is always use a good quality antifreeze which is ethylene glycol based this will act as a good summer coolant and an excellent antifreeze in the winter well that's the antifreeze dealt with before we check the radiator a couple of three other things that we've got to check while we're under the bonnet brake and clutch fluid that's if yours has got a hydraulic clutch it may be cable operated your handbook will tell you windscreen washer solvent this will stop your bottle freezing up in the winter and give you all the year round clear vision on your screen and a battery top up solution designed uh, especially for batteries though yours might be sealed for life check your handbook thoroughly and now let's go and see what we need in the radiator we remove the cap but before you do ensure that the engine is cool when they're hot engines run at high pressure sometimes up to 15 pounds per square inch and it can give you an extremely nasty burn we remove the cap and then we place our little glass dropper inside draw out some of the solution and we can see that three out of the four beads are floating at above halfway if you look on the gauge on the container you'll see that this cooling system has perfectly adequately looked after with regard to its cooling fluid we pop it back in before replacing the cap just check that the seal around the edge and the spring is operating successfully replace the cap now before we move ourselves away from the radiator system completely let's just have a look at the radiator hoses make sure that they're not hard brittle cracked or leaking in any way you have a top hose one down here which is the bottom hose which helps the cooling system to circulate and then you have these heater hoses which run from front to back of the engine well they're okay now we come over to this and most modern cars now have got this which is called a header tank what it is in fact is a, a bottle which is connected to the radiator so that when the, the water gets hot and expands it goes into the header tank and then when it cools down it goes back into the radiator meaning that you don't lose any of your cooling uh, efficiency they're polythene containers and you can see the minimum and maximum levels this one's alright so we don't need to touch it whilst we're under the bonnet we can now look at this side which is the brake fluid reservoir again they're using polythene these days to contain the fluid they have a minimum and maximum level and you can see quite clearly that this one is at the right level on this particular car we have a cable clutch so we don't need to look for a, a clutch fluid reservoir and now we go over to check the windscreen washer bottle and the battery you see this one is fairly low so we'll need to put some of the solution in it's graded on the side of the bottle but as a rough guide you want one part solution to ten parts water simply pour it in and then add fresh water it's fine replace the cap and now we'll look at the battery some batteries are sealed for life this one has got a facility where you can actually check to see whether it needs topping up with any of the deionized water specially made for batteries check that the electrolyte which is the fluid inside the battery is between one eighth of an inch and a quarter of an inch above the plates if not top it up and then replace the top any of the fluid out of the battery that gets onto your hands 
should be removed by washing immediately. Never, but never, smoke whilst at working near the battery. Check the terminals to make sure that the leads are firmly tightened and that there's no white furry deposits around where the nuts and bolts are. If there is a deposit on the battery terminal, a cupful of boiling water will remove it. Pour it over, but put plenty of water on to make sure that all of the deposits are completely washed away from the bodywork underneath. Dry it off and then smear it with a jelly such as this, or even your own domestic Vaseline, perfectly satisfactory to stop the deposits from coming back on again. Well, that's the complicated part of the general service over. But there are a few checks that we need to do outside the car on a weekly basis, and I'm going to need Mike's assistance to do them. I refer to the windscreen washers, the wipers, the lights, and the tires. So if you're ready, Mike. First, let's try the horn. Now let's check the washers and the wipers to make sure that they're working effectively. Remember, it's a legal requirement that they do. When you're ready, Mike. Ensure that the washer jets are aimed at the top of the screen. Remember, when you're traveling in a forward direction, the wind will bring the, the jet down towards the eye level. They're working okay. Now let's just check the lights. Side lights headlights, main beam, indicators, and the other side, that's fine. Now we'll check the rear lights of the vehicle, and on the way down, we'll have a look at the blades to make sure that they're in good order. What we're looking for is the blade to be in good condition, not torn or broken in any way. That's fine. And now we'll look at the rear lights. Rear lights, stop lights, indicators, and left. Fine. Fog lights, and reversing lights. That's great. Both of the number plate lights are intact. Right, that's the lights all done. Now let's check the tires. And now we come to the most important part of your car, and that's your connection with the road. We're talking, of course, about your tires. Once a week, you should check them, the walls, to make sure that there are no cuts, bruises, or abrasions. The tread depth should be checked. And remember, the minimum re legal requirement is only one millimeter. We believe you should change your tires when they get down to the two millimeter mark. If you want to know what one millimeter represents, it's to that serrated portion on the 10p coin. Insert your 10p coin in the tire debt tread. As you can see, this one is in very good condition. And now we check the tire pressures. Remove the cap, keeping it safe. That stops impurities getting in and causing damaged valves. Put the gauge onto the valve and read off. You'll see this has got 20 pounds in it. It should have 26. It therefore needs inflating. At this stage, having reflated the tires, in a normal service, we'd remove all four wheels and check the brakes. But that's much more complicated. A whole new ball game. And for that, you'll need tape number two.